Welcome back to my garage. We're converting this Jeep Wrangler into electric and today we're talking about how to start an EV conversion. Hi everybody, this is Electrified Veronica. I am converting this 99 Jeep Wrangler into electric. In the last video, I kind of presented the project overview and why I chose that car. And today I wanna give you an overview about the basic considerations and the decisions you have to make when you want to start an EV conversion. We will talk about the four potential electric powertrain configurations that we investigated and why we actually chose the final one. Let's imagine you found your dream car. In my case, this was inspired by watching Gilmore Girls. First thing you have to think about is how are you gonna use your car? How do you want your electric car to function? In my case, it should be kind of a daily driver so I can do my shopping with it. And then maybe I want to go from Milwaukee to Chicago and back in one day. I don't really plan any bigger road trips with that car and I also don't plan to do lots of off-roading but still I want to keep the four-wheel drive. What is your speed target and your acceleration target? So for me if I want to go from Milwaukee to Chicago I will obviously drive it on the highway so a maximum speed of around 80 to 90 miles an hour is perfect and for acceleration I guess I just want to have the original acceleration of the Jeep. We gotta be able to beat Mustangs, honey. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Another thing is temperature control. Do you want to have air conditioning in the summer or heating in the winter? So I am not a huge fan of air conditioning but I really need to heating in the winter because here in Wisconsin it's getting really really cold like minus 20 degrees C in the winter time so we definitely need a heating system. The final thing is that we really want to keep the original function of the Jeep so we see a lot of conversions where people just pack batteries into the trunk space or maybe where the bench would be but we really want to keep it as original as possible and it shouldn't be visible from the outside that this is a conversion. So try to find answers for that in the very beginning because all of that will affect the final electric powertrain configuration. It will affect the voltage that you work with and also, for example, how complex the formal system would look like in the end. So there is lots of uncertainties when starting out an EV conversion projects and lots of questions to answer, but there is one sure thing, one thing that everybody has to do, it's pulling the engine. So for me, it's really the first time that I'm doing anything like this. So if you don't have experience, I recommend you to go old school and get this repair manual where you really get step-by-step -step instructions for everything that you want to do. The first thing before you pull the engine is obviously getting your workshop ready. In our case, this was the garage. We built some work tables, put some carpets down. That was my idea, by the way. And I was really surprised about how many different tools and gadgets you need. For example, you need a really good air impact wrench to get the right torque for these rusted bolts. You need all kinds of different sized wrenches. Then you have to buy an engine hoist or rent it. And you buy a floor jack, jack stands. We built little wheel dollies. So there's lots of things you have to do before you can start the conversion. We started the real hands-on work on December 26th. The first step, and that's kind of ironic, was removing the little startup battery. Then we drained the engine oil. After that, we drained the cooling system. We removed the cooling fan and the radiator and removed the drive belt. That was kind of fun. Very, very important tip here. Label everything you take out especially of course if you want to use these things again later in your car and i know this is not fun but it's really worth it several times during these days we thought okay today is the day that we pull the engine but then there were a few little surprises that kind of took longer than we thought but finally on the 31st of december 2021 we pulled the engine overall how much effort was it you know it was a couple days of work it was just me and my husband so i have to be honest i was kind of surprised that it was 
rather easy. You know, there were a few frustrating moments during these days, but I think overall it was not too complex and definitely something that you can do. So after you pull the engine, there are really some major decisions that you have to make to move forward. How will your electric powertrain look like? So how does an electric powertrain work? And I'm really sorry about my artistic skills here, but I'm doing my best. Let's simplify it and say we have three main components in the electric powertrain. The battery, inverter, e-motor. The battery is a bit like your gas tank, but completely different. It stores electricity as chemical energy. Now the e-motor wants to use that electricity to drive your car. Since the e-motor that we chose works with AC power, we need an inverter to convert the DC power coming from the battery into AC that the e-motor needs and also to control the speed of the e-motor. So e-motor together with an inverter is called an e-drive. And the e-drive integrated into the axle is called the e-axle. Sorry again for my drawing. So let's look into the possible powertrain configuration. In total, we investigated four different options. Option one, two e-axles, one in the front, one in the rear. In this case, you get rid of the transmission and you get rid of the transfer case. You use one motor and one inverter in the front axle, really integrated with the differential, and another e-motor and inverter integrated in the rear axle. This is a very popular configuration for lots of OEMs, for example, Tesla and the Ford Mustang Mach-E are having two e-axles, one in the front, one in the rear. For us, we thought, first of all, it's a little expensive, and then second, it might be hard to control both of them. Option number two was using a Tesla e-axle, but rotated by 90 degree, so it fits right in the middle of the car. It would have two outputs, one to the front, one to the rear, and we really like this option because it's kind of creative, rotating the whole e-motor and inverter. But this would have involved a little more complex mechanical mounting and also wouldn't allow us to switch between two and four wheel drive. Option C was having four in-wheel motors. If you're honest, that was your favorite. So we would have really one e-motor inverter at each wheel. We saw some really cool in-wheel motors at the battery show and this allows you really to do some fun things like torque vector control, but obviously we didn't go with this option, I'm sorry. Option D, spoiler alert, this is the option that we finally chose, is having one e-motor and inverter in the front of the car and using the stock transfer case to allow us to have the selectable two-wheel four-wheel drive. You can do a cheap conversion like that also by keeping the transmission, but we decided against it because the e-motor that we get has a very high RPM. This means that we would have needed to get a speed reducer to get the RPM down for the transmission, but by then you can really get rid of the transmission overall. This will also save you some weight. So after we decided on the electric powertrain configuration, we started to do some basic calculations in order to select e-motor, inverter, and battery. So get your pen and paper ready, and in the next videos, we'll share some of the calculations that we did. See you next time.